I'm going to show you how to make a tart dough crust. This is what they would say on the Great British Baking Show, a short crust. So I have weighed out my six ounces of all-purpose flour, and most of the recipes in this country go by volume measurements. But you do get a much more precise measurement if you do weigh out your ingredients, and a lot of um, British recipes are written in weights. So we do suggest getting a scale if you um, are serious about baking and if you really want to learn. So if you do not have a scale or do not want to go out and buy one, you can look up conversions on the internet. There are a million out there and they will give you a rough estimate of what ounces is supposed to be what amount of cups. So, in here we have our all-purpose flour. I'm just gonna get that into my food processor. You can cut this in by hand, either with a pastry blender or a, just two knives will work as well. But we like using the food processor because it makes for much quicker work and it really comes together very, very quickly. Uh, so we have here our, what they say, icing sugar in uh, Great Britain, but we would call powdered sugar or confectioner sugar. So let's get that into our bowl of our food processor. I'm gonna give a nice, good, hefty chef's pinch of salt. I am a true believer in that uh, people don't season their baked goods enough, meaning they don't have enough salt. So we're going to show you how to use that because it really does bring out the flavor of everything. After we get this all mixed up, we are going to do what's called cutting in our fat. So let's first get this all just whizzed up and as quick as this. Done. When we are making a short crust or any type of pie crust, we want our fat to be very, very cold. So I just took this butter that I already kind of cut up into little cubes right out of the refrigerator. So it is very, very cold. And so that way we wind up with little clumps in our flour instead of winding up with just a mash of flour and butter. So get that into your food processor and then we just give it a couple quick pulses. Just bounce, bounce, bounce. Your flour and butter should almost look like breadcrumbs. Another reason we like using the food processor for this is because it cuts up your fat so quickly that it doesn't warm it up. And again, we don't want it to mash into our flour if it's warm. So now we need to get our liquid ingredients into our dough. So we're just calling for one tablespoon of very, very cold water and one egg yolk. So I'm going to make part of my water be some vanilla bean paste, or you can use extract here. So that way I'm not adding more moisture by adding a splash of vanilla into the dough, but we're adding some more flavor because the vanilla bean has flavor, water doesn't. So I just filled up the remainder of the tablespoon measure with my ice cold water and I literally had some ice cubes in there. I am going to turn on my food processor and let it roll as I'm drizzling in my wet ingredients. So I have my water with my vanilla bean paste and my egg yolk. I'm going to let it roll until we start to see the dough pick up for a ball and make its way around the food processor just like that. Make sure to take the blade out of your food processor before you take your dough out. You don't want to wind up catching your finger as you're taking that dough out. I'm going to take my dough out of my food processor and I'm going to put it right on some plastic wrap or what they would call cling film, the Great British Baking Show. So this is tarte au citron. So citron in French means lemon. So you can use lemon, you could use lime, you could use orange, you can even use grapefruit. Any citrus fruit will work here. You can even use other types of fruit juices as well. You just wouldn't have zest, obviously, in that case. So speaking of zest, let's go ahead and zest our lemon. Now these lemons are, I'd say, a little bigger than a golf ball, but a little smaller than a baseball. 
So that's really what you want to look for when you choose your lemons. Sometimes, depending on the time of year, your lemons could be this big or sometimes they could be this big. So if you wind up with a lemon that is this big, consider it two lemons. Now this lemon call, or this recipe calls for four lemons, zest and juice. So you really want to think about a tablespoon of zest and about a quarter cup of juice per lemon. And that's a, a good estimate for uh, judging the size of your lemon. So I am just fitted here with a measuring cup, a large volume measuring cup. And that's where I'm going to mix all my ingredients because it just makes it easier to pour into the tart crust later on. So I'm using my very fine grater, my microplane, and I'm just holding that right onto my measuring cup and I'm kind of anchoring myself onto it with my other fingers. And I'm going to move my lemon back and forth, but I'm also going to curve it along as I go. So I'm just getting the very outer colored part of the fruit. I'm not in danger of getting any of the bitter part underneath. It's called a pith. It's very bitter. There's enough tartness going on in this tart <laughs> that we don't also want to add bitterness to it. So if you see any white, stop. All right, after you get your lemon completely zested, because that's where all the, the flavor really lies, the essential oils. So we're getting a boost of that lemon flavor by doing your zesting. And make sure you zest your lemon first before you cut it in half. Makes it much easier to zest that way. So all my zest is stuck inside my microplane. So I just hold it flat, one smack, and then look, it's all gone. That's all you need to do. You don't need to scrape it with your finger. So I've already juiced three of my lemons. So if we think of the two little points here as North Pole, South Pole, we're going to cut across the equator. All right. And then I just have a little wire mesh strainer. I'm going to put that over my measuring cup and that's just going to help me catch any seeds because we have exposed the seeds here. But what we've also done is exposed all the juice within the segment. So that's why we want to cut it across the equator. So put your lemon in cut side up first. Lots of people will tell you to turn it over upside down. We'll do that too, but start cup side up because we've actually seen it happen in class where somebody had to use so much force when it was turned upside down that they broke the citrus reamer. So just start the easier way and then you can flip it over and get the remainder of the juice out. Now these are a couple of tools that I really do love having in the kitchen. There are some tools I think that you don't really need to have, but if you love citrus as much as we do, the microplane and the juicer or reamer are definite have to haves in our kitchen. We go through so many lemons and oranges, limes, that you know this makes our job so, so much easier. Some of the ingredients in the Great British Baking Show we're not quite familiar with in this country. So they say double cream, which we don't really sell a double cream here in the States. So choose a heavy cream that has a good amount of fat to it. This is one we love to use because it is old fashioned, it's non-homogenized, and you can really see the fat of the cream settle up on top. So we like to use this when we have just opened it and we get all that cream that's sitting right on top to make sure we have a good amount of fat for all that great flavor. Uh, they're also calling for free range eggs. So pasture raised essentially equates free range. And you can just see the difference in the color of the yolks. They are super duper orange. And that just gives so much richness, so much flavor to your recipe. So we suggest trying to use those when we're doing something a little bit more special. So I'm going to mix everything for my custard for my tart right in that measuring cup where I juiced all my lemons. So I've already cracked four of my eggs, but I'm going to crack one more. So we always say crack it on a flat surface, smack, press in with the sides of our finger like this, and then pull out. You 
you are much less likely to pop your yolk if you're separating your egg. Plus, if you crack it on a sharp surface like that, you can make a very jagged edge and you can kind of draw bacteria into the egg. So just be bold, get into it, and uh, you'll, you'll get the hang of it pretty quickly. All right, so we have our sugar. I'm gonna get that in there. This recipe does call for caster sugar, which is the very, very fine sugar that we would use for, say, a macaron. But I haven't found that there's really any difference between using regular granulated sugar and caster sugar. So I'm gonna use what's a little bit less expensive, which is the uh, just regular granulated. All right, I'm gonna get all my beautiful free range eggs into that cup and my four ounces of that gorgeous heavy cream. And even though the recipe does not call for these other ingredients, as you know, if you know me, I always throw in a little bit of salt. I'm gonna throw in eh, a pinch more because those lemons are super duper tart. So the salt will help tone down that tartness or that acidity. Okay, also, you know us, we love our BBP or vanilla bean paste. Nice, good squeeze of that. And that just helps boost up the sweet flavors of everything else that's in the recipe. It doesn't essentially make a taste of a vanilla tart. I'm just gonna use my whisk and make sure that everything in there is homogenous, meaning it looks like one smooth ingredient. We don't wanna see streaks of egg white or streaks of egg yolk. That it just looks like one good smooth color. And then, I know there's those raw eggs in there, but hey, I know you eat cookie dough. So taste it, make sure it tastes delicious. Ooh, it's so bright, it tastes like lemonade. Okay, I am gonna add one more pinch of salt, just because it is still pretty tart, and that'll just tone that down a little bit, but also make it taste more lemony, and it'll make it taste more sweet. My dough has been chilling and resting for roughly a half an hour. So I'm going to take it out of my plastic wrap and I'm going to roll it out to put into my tart pan. A trick that we love to show people in classes is that you can roll your short crust out between two pieces of parchment paper. And that way you don't have to add a bunch more flour and sort of dilute the flavor and also the texture of your dough. Now what I like to do is put my parchment on top of a silicone mat. And that way, the parchment paper doesn't slide around on your work surface. I've seen people also put a couple droplets of water on your surface, and that helps the parchment not to slide around, but the silicone mat works really, really well. Some people like to make fun of me because I like to use the rolling pin with the handles. This is what I grew up with. This is what I feel comfortable with. I feel like it distributes your weight evenly. And I think it's easier to use than a French rolling pin. But if that's what you grew up with and that's what you feel comfortable with, by all means, use that. I'm just going to make sure that I roll my pastry crust out evenly. So I usually start north-south, then I go east-west, northwest, northeast, after I do that a few times, I take my crust up and I feel it between my two hands. Okay, and that way I know if I'm getting a little bit thicker or thinner in any one spot. I rolled my pastry crust out until it's roughly an inch wider than my tart shell. This is another great reason I like to use a piece of parchment is that it makes it much easier to pick the dough up and put it into your tart shell. So just make sure you have a good grip on it and then gently nestle it down into the tart shell. If you wind up having any little tears, that's the great thing about short crust is that you can do patchwork with it. It's not like a flaky pastry dough, like a pie crust, where you can't really patch it up. I've pushed my pastry crust down into my pie plate 
and I just make sure that it's not really thick around the edges because you can wind up with some raw dough there. So just tamp your finger all around those corners. And then again, if you see any little tears or holes, just take off a little extra piece and just kind of patch it up just like that, super easy. See how I have a little bit of overhang there? Right now I wanna leave that because sometimes your pastry crust can slump down as you're blind baking it. And then if you have already trimmed off your excess, there won't be any to kind of sink down in with it. So I'm gonna leave that there for now. Because we do not want to wind up with the dreaded soggy bottom, as we've heard so much about on Great British Baking Show, we are going to do what's called blind baking our pie crust. So what that just means is to bake it in the oven with no filling in it. Simple as that. So we're also going to do what's called docking. So I'm going to use a fork just to create some indents in the bottom of my pastry shell. And what that does is to help some air release or some steam release as it's baking. And that way we don't wind up with a puffed up bottom and then we're not left with anywhere to put our filling. Now that I am rolled out and all patched up and docked, I need to get my baking beans into my pie plate. So I'm just gonna reuse one of the pieces of parchment paper that we used to roll out our pastry crust and just push it into the sides, just like we did the pastry crust. And then these are just dried beans. You can use rice for this as well. And they do sell ceramic pie weights. They do supposedly help distribute the heat and give you a little bit more even bake, but these probably cost a dollar as opposed to going out and buying a $20 set of ceramic pie weights. So after you bake this, you can reuse those beans a zillion times. We've probably had these same beans since we opened. I'm going to bake my tart shell on a sheet pan just in case any of the little overhang falls off. It just makes for much easier cleanup. We don't have to pick pieces of cooked dough off of the bottom of our oven. And I'm just gonna use the other piece of parchment that I used to roll out our tart shell to line that sheet pan. And again, if those little pieces fall off, it makes for much easier cleanup. So I'm going to go ahead and set that tart shell on top of my sheet pan, get this baking in the oven 400 for about 10 to 12 minutes, then we'll take these beans out. My tart shell has been baking for about 10 minutes, so now I'm going to take the beans out of the pan, and we can see that they have weighted the crust down enough to the point where the bottom is not puffing up. I can see it still looks a bit shiny, and that means it's not quite baked yet, so I'm going to get it back in there for about five to seven more minutes until we start to see a pale brown color. My tart crust is out of the oven, and we can see it has a nice, good, pale, golden color. We don't want it to be too dark at this point because we still have to bake the custard in the tart crust. So we don't want it to wind up over baking, but we also don't want that dreaded soggy bottom. So we want to make sure that it's at least set before we put our custard into it. So now is the time when I trim off my edges to make sure that we have a really pretty appearance. So I'm just going to take a serrated knife and I'm going to pull gently toward myself all the way around the tart crust. And that way, any of the little bits fall to the outside instead of falling inside of the crust. I took my 
my tart pan off of my sheet pan just to get rid of any of those little off cuts and that way those don't wind up burning as you're baking your custard. This is a great tool, it's a pizza peel, to move your tart pan on and off of the sheet pan. If you don't have one of those, just a large spatula will work. Uh, a cake spatula will work for that as well. Just something wide and flat because we have a removable bottom underneath so we don't want to wind up putting our hand underneath and pushing that false bottom up and breaking our crust that we worked so hard on. I'm going to add my custard to my tart shell while it's on a rack in the oven and that way I'm not having to carry around a pan with a liquid that's kind of sloshing around on the inside. Our tart has been in the oven for about 35 minutes or so and I can see that it looks a little bit dry on top and definitely that the crust has browned quite a bit more. So we just want to give our tart a little bit of a jiggle. So if we see that we have a slight wobble like that, that is perfect because it's going to have some carryover cooking after it comes out of the oven. And if we see that it's already set, when it's in the oven, when it has its carryover cooking, it's going to be like rubber. So if we take it out a little bit before where we want it, then it's going to carry over to a beautiful, silky texture. So we let our tart chill in the refrigerator overnight, and that helps it set up a lot firmer so you can slice it easier. If you don't have time to do that, you can cut into it the day that you make it. However, uh, it might be a little bit gooey and you might have a harder time getting a nice clean slice. But if you can't wait, don't worry about it. So this is, uh, again, a removable bottom. So we just take the outside ring off. And then it's a very easy finish. We're just going to do some powdered sugar. I always like to show people this trick. If you tap the powdered sugar on your hands like this, it comes out very much easier than if you just try and shake it. You get really good coverage. This is just a sifter. If you don't have one of these, you can just put some powdered sugar in a mesh strainer. And then again, do the same thing. It will come out faster than with the shaker. So just be aware you don't want a pile of powdered sugar on your tart. Okay, looking good. Let's give it a little slice. Looking like it's holding up beautifully. Gorgeous, looks amazing. I might uh, dip into this and have a little try. Let's check for the soggy bottom. <laughs> nope, looking beautiful.